Winds in the east, there's a mist coming in, like something is brewing and about to begin. Can't put my finger on what lies in store, but I feel what's to happen all happened before. Hello everybody, I'm KC, and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk About. Today, let's talk about how great it is that this movie didn't suck. Like a lot of you, I let out a groan of contempt when it was first announced that Disney was making a sequel to one of their most beloved films, Mary Poppins. A movie that I love, like pretty much everyone else does. But Mary Poppins Returns was another one of those instances where as more announcements came out about who was involved with this movie, the creative choices they were making, and how dedicated everyone was to making this a worthy successor, it made me let my guard down a bit to the point that I was actually kind of anticipating this movie in the weeks leading up to its release. Now yes, making a sequel to one of Disney's most well-crafted and highly acclaimed films over 50 years after the fact sounds really bad on paper, and yes, I would have preferred it if they had just left this movie alone, but we should all realize by now this is Disney and that's not how this works especially lately. So if they continue to insist on doing these things, all we can hope for is that they're good and if they, for lack of a better phrase, merit existing. And in the end, I think this does. Why? Well, let's take a closer look at Mary Poppins Returns. 25 years have gone by and the Banks children are all grown up. Michael Banks with three children of his own. But Michael's family has fallen on hard times after his wife passed away and they are in danger of losing their family home. With things looking hopeless, a practically perfect figure must drop in from the sky again to set things right. The most important thing that sets this movie apart right away is that you can tell the people who worked on this loved Mary Poppins. That might seem like an odd claim, but that's not something I get from a lot of these current remakes and sequels I've been seeing from Disney lately. Usually it comes off like they're trying to fix something that wasn't broken while missing the point of what made people love it in the first place. And while Mary Poppins Returns certainly had its more deviating and ambitious moments, there's no question that this movie set out to be as worthy a sister film to the original as it could be, capturing the whimsy and magic of the original as closely as possible while mixing things up a bit to create something new. It's not trying to one-up the movie that came before it because it knows it can't, and I kind of respect that. If you want a more detailed examination of just how much the people behind this movie love Mary Poppins, Dave Lee Down Under did a really comprehensive video on all the easter eggs in this movie from the 1964 film and even the original books. Seeing how much the creative team behind this movie loves and respects Mary Poppins gives the whole movie a sort of nostalgic vibe with more modern pacing and story beats that help tell the story of this movie without hurting the overall legacy. In a weird way, the movie is both sincere and self-aware. They couldn't pull that trick of Mary Poppins looking out for the children while really trying to help the father gain perspective as subtly as they did the last time because we all would have caught on. We know the drill at this point. They pointed out Mary Poppins' true intentions in the first trailer for crying out loud. What brings you here after all this time? Same thing that brought me the first time. I've come to look after the Banks children. Us? Oh yes, you too. It's sort of like how the second Lego movie was way more obvious about how much the kids were controlling the story, because they knew they couldn't pull the same trick again and get the same result. So they instead let us in on the secret early and made us more curious as to where it was going. Not only did the stakes have to be high enough for Mary Poppins to come back, which I assume is something she doesn't do often with the same family, but the emotional core had to be more present since we know these people, and had to believe that a kid who walked around in a chalk painting and had a floating tea party would become so downtrodden. But we'll come back to Michael. Right now, let's talk about the star of the show, played by the lovely and talented Emily Blunt. I'm not gonna sit here and make an outrageous claim like Emily Blunt is the only actress who could have pulled this off. After all, the live musical version has a handful of more than competent mystical nannies. But I struggle to think of an actor working today who could have pulled off such a demanding role with such grace and dignity. This was the one part you could not under any circumstances, 
screw up. If the audience didn't believe Blunt was Mary Poppins, the movie would have fallen apart regardless of everything else. But thankfully, Blunt carries that mysterious yet upfront, sophisticated yet larger-than-life presence as effortlessly as the wind carries a kite. Emily Blunt has said several times that instead of going back to Julie Andrews' performance, she turned to the books to figure out what makes the character so special while still making it her own. And I'm not sure how, but that approach paid off. Off. Blunt certainly puts her own spin on the character, being a bit more vain and no-nonsense, but you can still easily believe that it's the same character Julie Andrews portrayed all those years ago. And I know I say that something is difficult to pull off a lot, but that combination is near impossible. Something I do really like about Blunt's performance in particular is you can tell when she's pulling the strings, leading people in the direction she wants them to go in, whether it's trying to lead the kids or Michael to a revelation or matchmaking. We'll get to that. Again, it's one of those elements that plays with the formula we already know, but it's subtle enough that it's not right in your face and even easy to miss on your first watch through. She is Mary Poppins. And the fact that I believe that is enough to recommend this movie. But she's not the only one lighting the way. Her forever young at heart companion this time around is a lamplighter, Jack, played by Lin-Manuel Miranda, which is not his first film role. A quick look at Wikipedia will tell you differently, but it's at least his first musical film role. Yeah, I'm surprised it took this long too. I'm just gonna be upfront about this. I love Jack as a character. While he serves the same basic story function as Bert did in the original movie, He's not the same character. Where Bert is implied to be at least semi-phenomenal, nearly cosmic, but less so than Mary Poppins, there's no question that Jack is just a regular guy. And having known Bert, he knew Mary Poppins. And unlike most as they grow up, hasn't forgotten what she really is. And there's something really endearing about that. He just hangs around, and anytime it looks like some fun magical antics can be had, he just wants to indulge in it. Mary Poppins objects, and then he says, please... And then she's like, well, okay. I think you realize this the most when he just jumps into the middle of the covers at the book number after convincing Mary Poppins to perform in the first place. He's just so excited and happy to be in this kind of adventure and it's just the best. I love it. That, and unlike Bert, Jack can seem to hold down a regular job. But there is one other reason Jack is here and it involves Jane. Now, while I have made it very clear in the past that I'm not one to ship characters, when I do, I often often go for the ones that are totally canon and some might consider boring, but sometimes it just works so well you just can't help yourself. And, well, so two, two doors down. down. <laughs> oh my god, they're so cute! Many thanks, sincerely. <laughs> Though part of me kind of wishes we knew a bit more about his experience with Mary Poppins, or that he had a more personal moment with Jane or even Michael, reminiscing on his outlook. Not so much explaining why he is the way he is, just having a more personal moment with the characters we already know, like the moments Bert had in the original. In fact, I think Bert's moment with George Banks is one of the most underrated scenes in the first movie. It's by no means a deal breaker, but Jack is such a great character that I just wanted more of. And while there's no need to praise Lin-Manuel Miranda more than everyone else has in the past, I also have to attribute the fact that Jack is so freaking appealing to the performance. With a less charismatic actor, Jack could have been, frankly, really boring. This is why you hire theater performers for your movie musicals, folks. I also want to take some time to sing the praises of the new Banks children because I don't see a lot of people talking about them. They have a great dynamic among the three of them. They aren't just a rinse and repeat of Jane and Michael in the first movie. The closest who's like that is the youngest, Georgie. Cute callback, by the way. But when it comes to John and Annabelle, they consider themselves very independent. Their mother had supposedly taught them a lot about independence, but because of her death, they had to use those skills to grow up quickly, removing any sense of belief and imagination which Mary Poppins works to reignite in them, but not at the cost of them wanting to take care of themselves. Throughout the movie, the kids get in trouble for taking on more than they can handle. In the wrong hands, this could have come off as the kids getting in trouble for trying to be responsible, but actually, they get in trouble for trying to solve problems like the threat of losing their house by themselves. And no kid should have to feel or handle that kind of responsibility. Mary Poppins never discourages the kids from being helpful and responsible. In fact, she insists on it multiple times. She just sets things in motion for the children to figure out for themselves that they are biting off more than they can chew, reminds them of what it's like to be kids, and that it's okay to be like that while still being
being mature. Child actors can be a coin toss in terms of tolerability, especially in family films, but this movie managed to get three great kids to perform these parts. Pixie Davies and Nathaniel Sela spend most of the movie working together and have a great team dynamic, both giving off the sense of being both mature and naive. And by the grace of the writing and Joel Dawson's performance, Georgie is endearing in the typical childlike way and not annoying like he very easily could have been. Well, we've got a good group of heroes, so let's take a second to talk about our villain. Yes, a Mary Poppins movie has a villain. The new head of Fidelity Fiduciary Bank, Mr. Wilkins, played by Colin Firth. Let me stress that I understand why some people don't like Wilkins. His motivation is played out and tired and like a lot of other family film villains, and to the sequel of an antagonist less movie, it can make it feel more formulaic. And in a way, it kind of is. But what I think works about Wilkins for me is just how subdued he is about his true intentions. He's great at hiding it, which doesn't make Michael look like an idiot, and his easy to switch two-faced nature is part of what makes him so threatening. Props to Colin Firth on that front, by the way. God, this movie is well cast. And really, can you honestly tell me people like Wilkins don't exist? Despite his motivations being similar to much weaker villains, this guy could, and probably does, exist in the real world. At least he never laughs maniacally about how he's going to get away with exploiting his clients. Maniacal laugh. <laughs> Maniacal laugh. <laughs> Again, I'm not saying it's perfect or that the movie even needed him, but that's why it doesn't bother me as much as it does a lot of others. Now, before we go too deep into the grounded aspects of this movie, let's take a larger look at the magical and imaginative. Like, the fact that this movie is gorgeous. Like, every inch of the production design was so well crafted. Guys, this is a really pretty movie. The costumes are well detailed and make each character stand out, the sets are eye-catching in a way that makes you want to spend as much time as possible in each. One of my favorite details is how Cherry Tree Lane is both familiar, but different. Like, time has actually passed like it's supposed to have since the last time we were here. I also wasn't expecting the Admiral to still be kicking around. Good for him. You see this the most with the Banks family home. Like, it's been lived in a lot by two different families over the years. Though the nursery is laid out completely differently. Like, the windows are in completely different places, and I don't remember a balcony. It's not a huge problem by any stretch, but with how much the crew really paid attention to details, especially in the production design, the more drastic changes can feel sort of disorienting when you watch these scenes back to back. But a segment that is not only fun and whimsical and just downright beautiful, but a scene I am so incredibly grateful for is a moment that may have been one of the most important production design callbacks of them all. And they nailed it, guys. It's 2D traditional animation. People drew these things in animals with their hands on paper. No Tomb Boom, no CGI. Gorgeous traditional animation brought to life in a delightful stylized sequence that despite how you feel about the rest of the movie, I don't know anyone who doesn't like this. And thank goodness they did it this way because it would not have worked with CGI. Now, I don't want to badmouth CGI because it does give a lot of great visual styles. Even in this very movie, in the Can You Imagine That sequence, where Mary Poppins and the kids swim through a CGI ocean, and it's pretty beautifully done. In fact, the Royal Dolls and Bowls scene was originally going to have CGI characters. Disney was even adamant on this for a long time. But director Rob Marshall pushed and pushed for this traditionally animated sequence, and I think we should all be grateful to him for doing that until Disney eventually agreed. They clearly took painstaking efforts to make this look stylized, crisp and natural. This could also be due to the fact that animation virtuoso James Baxter was heavily involved with the animation here. Are you even surprised? The animal designs are instantly endearing and harken back to the Disney cartoons of Mary Poppins era in the 1960s while modernizing them to be more distinct and the ways they interact with the actors is fluid and expressive. It just really works and production-wise is probably the most well-realized sequence in the movie. And the details don't end there. When I saw this in the theater, after a minute or so, I squinted a bit and realized something. The designs on the costumes are painted on. 
It's details like that that I really appreciate about the Royal Dalton Bowl scenes in particular. How much effort they put into transferring the characters into this completely artistic world for 10 to 15 minutes. I even got a kick out of the chasing towards the end. I know not everyone loved it, and when I first saw it, it felt out of place to me too, but I got into it fairly quickly, and the animation on the wolf looks so cool. When was the last time you saw crazy eyes like that in a cartoon? Honestly, my only problem with the Royal Dalton Bowl section is how abruptly it ends. The whole group managed to get out after the chase somehow, and suddenly all the kids are tucked in and completely fine. Plus, Jack just kind of disappears. Where the heck did he go? Did they really think we wouldn't notice? Again, I don't want everything in Mary Poppins explained, but I think that scene could have used a better transition. Okay, I've waited long enough. Let's talk about the music. What absolutely sold me on seeing this movie was when I heard the music was being written by Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, one of my absolute favorite songwriting teams. Their most well-known work is probably the musical Hairspray, but my favorite works of theirs come from the Catch Me If You Can musical and the short-lived NBC show Smash, both of which have excellent soundtracks and contain some of my favorite songs of all time. So even when I was still skeptical about this movie, I was incredibly excited to see a collaboration between Disney and these two. And it absolutely does not disappoint. First of all, I I really appreciate that this movie musical sequel doesn't recycle songs from the first movie. They do call back to the classic songs and the score in a very natural and nostalgic way, but all the full-on musical numbers are completely original. And Shaman and Whitman do an amazing job at paying homage to the work of the Sherman Brothers while bringing what I love so much about their collaborations, the pleasant flowing melodies and clever, almost quotable lyrics. Let me give you a quick rundown of the soundtrack since it's arguably my favorite thing about the movie. Underneath the lovely London sky is what opens the movie and was reportedly the toughest song to nail down. After all, it's the return to a classic for both an old and new generation. Starting on the right note is key. But Underneath the lovely London sky is not only a great introduction to the feel of the movie and its soundtrack and a pleasant return to Cherry Tree Lane, but it gives us an almost perfect glimpse at Jack's worldview through some almost inspirational lyrics. But since you dreamed the night away, Tomorrow's here, it's cold today. Can You Imagine That is an excellent reintroduction to Mary Poppins herself, reminding us how she can twist the situation to get her point across. The phrase, Can You Imagine That, takes on a lot of different meanings throughout the song, and it is very clever. The Royal Dalton musical song is just a great meal of tongue-twisting lyrics, making it a lot of fun to both listen to and sing along with. It's less than a minute and a half long, but still manages to be an ambitious number. But if we're talking about ambitious, look no further than Cover is Not the Book, an upbeat and unashamedly theatrical number. The lyrics are once again quick, clever, full of references to Mary Poppins' printed stories, and practically begs you to sing along. The choreography is lively and polished, and it's one of those songs that fits their performer's strengths like a glove. Especially Lin-Manuel Miranda's ability to say a lot of complicated lyrics, ridiculously fast. Like some of the songs from the original movie, a lot of the songs in Mary Poppins Returns distills one of Mary Poppins' life lessons in a musical form. The most important one this time around is The Place Where the Lost Things Go, which is connected to one of the most important emotional points in the movie that is a landmark in Disney history. A dead mom that is actually an essential plot point that drives most of the emotion in the movie. We've had that with fathers, brothers, and even children, but the mother, eh, they're pretty disposable. Mary Poppins Returns washes its hands of that, and I am so incredibly grateful for it. What's so beautiful about this song, though, is that it works for the loss the children feel, but isn't specifically for it. The song isn't only about those who pass away, but the people who leave an impact on our lives even after they're no longer in it for whatever reason, and that they will always stay with us as long as we appreciate what they left behind. Which, when you give it more than a passing thought, can apply to someone else we might know. Once again, Blunt's performance is beautiful and soothing, and certainly much more comforting than the last time she sang in a family film. Open up your eyes, give up your sweet fantasy land. And you remember how 
how in the original movie we met Mary Poppins' eccentric Uncle Albert? Well, here's her cousin Topsy. And like Uncle Albert, she gets her own song, Turning Turtle. I don't have much to say about this one that I haven't said about the others, although it is really good. So to keep it simple, it's another fun sing-along treat that has a twist of Mary Poppins and stealing more of her knowledge towards the end. What makes this number stand out, though, is Meryl Streep's energetic and quirky performance. But is this commitment why she only cameoed in Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again? I mean, if Colin Firth and Julie Walters can make the time. Come to think of it, why is half the cast of Mamma Mia in this movie? And quite possibly the most ambitious musical number in the film, Triple Little Light Fantastic. Great title. This is Mary Poppins Returns answer to Step in Time, and it certainly lives up to it. The lyrics continue to be full of clever rhyming schemes, the choreography is elaborate and probably the most ambitious of the movie that flows beautifully, including those awesome BMX bikers that are so ridiculous they shoot around the moon and go right back to being awesome, and led to many, many Lin-Manuel Miranda pole dance jokes. In all seriousness, while this is very much an ensemble number, Miranda really leads the group excellently. The energy is electric and the enthusiasm is contagious. The best way I can describe it and all the musical numbers is that they are pure theater. Rob Marshall is amazing at naturally translating a Broadway language to film, and this is no exception. I've heard people call the songs forgettable, in fact it's probably the most common criticism I've heard towards the movie, and it's the one I understand the least. The music was what ultimately drew me in, and the soundtrack has been in my regular rotation ever since. I know I skipped a couple, and we'll get to them, but right now I want to focus on one song in particular, as it displays the conflicts and state of mind of the next Mr. Banks, the con conversation. It so perfectly encapsulates Michael's personal struggles, his blissful nostalgia for the way things were, what it was like to love a character that we never get to meet but connect with through him, and how he's still grieving over not just Kate, but the fear that things might never be like that again without her. Ben Wingshaw may not be the strongest singer here, but he presents the conflicting emotions in this song simply and beautifully. And if there's one character going through a very emotional journey here, it's Michael. Despite growing some distinct facial hair, Michael isn't his father, which would have been so easy to do, but thankfully, both of the original Banks children are giving their own past. Even though they both carry on traits of their parents, I completely buy that this Jane and Michael are the kids we met in the first movie, influenced by their surroundings, shaped by their own personalities, and transformed by their experiences. I especially like the detail of making Jane a labor organizer. It's a way to show her mother's influence while having the cause fit with the time period and not being exactly the same thing. The critical difference between George and Michael, I think, is that we saw Michael with that childhood spark inside him. We first meet George Banks when he's a rigid adult with questionable priorities, but with Michael, the first two-thirds of this movie is seeing how time and unfortunate circumstances have crushed his spirit. A spirit we saw at its brightest in his childhood. And it seems like he kept that for a while since he became an artist, even if he didn't remember all the stuff he and Jane did with Mary Poppins. He's also a good dad. He has great moments of being a team with his kids, and any moments where he does lose his temper or scold the kids, he either apologizes for his outburst, or you understand why he's acting that way. Because he's trying to deal with so much by himself. This isn't the typical dad you work too hard story. Able to dodge a cliche like the original did while having, like its predecessor, a lot of the same beats. Instead, it's a story of a man who realizes that, in difficult times, if you don't keep your worries to yourself, it can make the burden easier to carry. What Michael, Annabel, and John learn is that they don't have to fix all these problems on their own. In fact, doing so only made things worse and more stressful. People say that Michael's story of losing his wife and about to lose his house is cliche, and you know what? Maybe it is. But just because it's seen in stories time and time again to the point that it gets tiring, doesn't mean a good story can't be told with it. Most stories have been told to death. It's all a matter of how you tell it. And that there aren't people out there who can relate to this. We all can. Because ever since the first Mary Poppins movie came out and has been in every family's movie collection, we've all had to grow up. Michael's arc paints a very real picture of being hit by the burdens of adulthood. We've all faced struggles with the more responsibility we're expected to take on, of financial troubles, growing families, tedious jobs, and the loss of loved ones. Sometimes our whole lives change because of actions we had no agency in but still have to deal with. Much like how this movie takes place in the middle of the England equivalent of the Great Depression. And I think all of that is why I admire Jack as a character so much, because none of those burdens seem to bother him. 
him. He's a lower class worker with an unrequited crush, and yet he still finds as much magic and, well, light in the world as much as he probably ever has. And that's something to aspire for, at least to me. But for Michael, it all becomes too much, leading to him breaking down in front of his kids. But as they show how much they've grown through the lessons Mary Poppins taught them, he sees that and is ready to move forward. And it's that connection that leads him to what he needed to save their house. That was on the back of one of Michael's drawings that Georgie then cut up and used to patch up the kite. That is literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay, this is my one big complaint with the movie. How did Michael not notice what this was? Yes, I know Michael's presented as somewhat absent-minded, which is a reasonable character flaw. Yes, I know they showed him drawing on the back of a document earlier in the movie to foreshadow this, but that was just a quick little doodle. This is a really elaborate sketch. For a professional artist like Michael, this would have taken about half an hour, maybe longer. Are you telling me that he not only didn't notice what this was when he drew this, but he just had happened to not look at the other side of it when he was going through every piece of paper in his house to find the only document capable of saving said house when this is a recurring habit of his? I give them credit for foreshadowing it so subtly, but I feel like there could have been a better way of revealing this or at least getting him from point A to point B. Like maybe having Georgie find it in a box Michael hadn't gone through yet. As it stands, it's not the best plot point and given that it's one of the most important, it's not doing this movie any favors. And I know a lot of people have a problem with the race against the clock almost action sequence of a climax. While I will admit that it threw me off a bit too seeing something like this in a Mary Poppins movie, I've enjoyed it more with each watch through. It is exciting all things considered and I appreciate that they tried something different from the original that still keeps it consistent with the universe. It's a tough balancing act but I think it works all things considered. Though as much as I've warmed up to it, I question why they didn't just get to the top from the inside. I mean someone has to be able to maintain those lights so there's probably a way in, right? I know the image of a bunch of Leary scaling Big Ben looks kind of cool, but they couldn't have at least tried the door? But the thing that ends up resolving the Banks family struggle to save their house is without a doubt the best reveal in the movie. You have shit there, Willie. I have seen this movie twice with an audience, and despite Dick Van Dyke's cameo being mentioned in the very first trailer and highly publicized, this entrance got a great reaction out of both crowds. Yes, Dick Van Dyke returns as the head banker, Mr. Dawes. Wait, didn't he die? Oh, okay. It's amazing fan service with Dick Van Dyke giving off such charisma in such a short amount of time. He tap dances on a desk, guys. This man is over 90. He is an inspiration to us all. It's also a way for the events of both movies to come full circle. In Mary Poppins, the influence of the bank is the closest thing to a villain. But by the end of the first movie, George Banks had brought a sort of levity to the bankers after he learned what was really important. And once he does, the bankers loosen up a bit too. And it's because of that that he gets what he always wanted. So this time, the villain had to take a more literal form with Wilkins, and I appreciate that the influence of Mary Poppins' last visit has had such a long-lasting impact. The attitude of Dawes and how he runs Fidelity Fiduciary has changed considerably, and for the better. To the point that once he's back in charge, the Banks family problem is resolved almost immediately. By revealing that the tuppence Michael gave to his father grew in the bank over time into enough to pay off Michael's debts. Well, ain't that convenient. I thought at first that this reveal was a contrived off-screen retcon to link the two movies together, but uh, nope. This did happen in the first movie. I just forgot. There's the tuppence. The wonderful, fateful, super-colored, fragilistic, expiatidocious tuppence. Got it well. So now, it's a cute way to connect the movies. The final piece to show that despite the fact that George still worked at the bank in such a high position, he learned to put his family ahead of his status. Looking out for his family even after he's gone. After all, nothing's gone forever. But there is one more obvious cameo. A practically perfect actress by the name of... Angela Lansbury? Now, no disrespect to Angela Lansbury. It's a wonderful and wholesome cameo, much like Van Dyke's, and makes sense since she starred in Bedknobs and Broomsticks, which was basically Disney's answer to Mary Poppins if they didn't manage to get the rights. But you could tell that this role was totally meant for Julie Andrews. Thankfully, it's a well-known bit of trivia that Julie Andrews declined to appear because she didn't want to steal the show from Emily Blunt. While I personally don't think this role at the very end of the movie would have done that, I respect her decision. Angela Lansbury's appearance brings us to the final song, Nowhere to Go But Up. Again, great title. It's a very sweet and, for lack of a better word, 
straightforward, uplifting way to conclude all the character arcs from throughout the film, from both major and minor characters. It's also, oddly, the only time Emily Mortimer gets to sing in the movie. Boy, did she get the short end of the stick. The image of a bunch of people floating in the sky hanging from balloons is magical on its own. Then you add in the inspirational and endearing lyrics performed by a marvelous ensemble, and you've got one heck of a finale. And the movie ends in a similar way to the original, with Mary Poppins moving on and flying off to her next mission. But the difference this time is that, while not to her face, Jane and Michael take a moment to thank and finally say goodbye to Mary Poppins. Aww. Did we really need the sequel to Mary Poppins when the original is easily accessible and still loved to this day? Probably not. Are the people who don't like this movie because it played it safe and didn't really take risks wrong in their opinion? Not really. Was this movie mostly greenlit so they could sell expensive dolls and penguin plushes at Disney World? Undoubtedly. But, that said... Screw the haters. I love this story and I love this cast. I love this music and overall I love this movie. This movie's so great. I can understand the argument that this is too much like the original. A lot of the songs in terms of where they are and what they serve for the story are similar and there are very familiar themes and story beats, which can make this whole endeavor seem redundant. But they were treading on very, very thin ice here. And if they deviated too much to try and make it more unique, people would be complaining for different reasons and it might not feel quite like Mary Poppins. Heck, they did that a couple of times and that's exactly what happened. For me, Mary Poppins Returns does something that most of these latest reimaginings of classic Disney properties haven't managed to do. Recapture the original magic and wrap it in nostalgia while forming its own identity. And having that sense of humility to know that it can't outdo the originals inspired by, but the effort and care to be as respectable a companion to Mary Poppins as it possibly could be. It's not perfect. Perfect, of course. There are weak plot points that could have been polished with maybe one more draft, and certain elements that I wish were fleshed out more, though I'm not quite sure if wanting to spend more time in a movie's world and with its characters is a fault. But Mary Poppins Returns has so much to offer in terms of spectacle and sentiment, and to me the strengths far outweigh the weaknesses that I just spent the last 6,000 words conveying. Or maybe this just happened to come out around a time where trying to advance in adulthood against the obstacles has kind of been crushing my soul. Not as bad as the Banks family, thankfully, but still, we all have frustrations. And like the original Mary Poppins, it's nice to see a new journey with the magical nanny, but the children who have since grown up like all of us have, show that a little levity and remembering the simpler joys can make a dark time brighter, and that it's never too late to improve the present, and hopefully, the future. To answer my question from the beginning of the video, yes, I think Mary Poppins Returns merits existing, and I'm glad it does. I think a lot of people needed Mary Poppins to return just as much as the original Banks children did. If this must exist, and it clearly must, this is the kind of thing I want to see from Disney repackaging their classic stuff. Whether it's a remake, a sequel, an adaptation, or the very rare instance of something entirely new, if a movie can give you a sentimental feeling as you walk out, leaving you more enriched than you were before, that is something special. And if you're willing to accept a simpler mindset and a more complicated time, that is exactly what Mary Poppins Returns does. Whatever the next decade has in store, just remember, there's nowhere to go but up. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.